So you're in uh, uh, Computational Protein Structure Prediction and Design. Welcome. Um, I'm Jeff Gray. I'm uh, Associate Professor here at Johns Hopkins and uh, my major area of research is in protein structure prediction and design. I work on protein, protein interactions and protein interactions with surfaces like in biomineralization processes, also antibodies and um, a little bit of protein design. Um, what I want to talk about, uh, well, this semester this is an elective class, so I want to have a little bit of fun and teach people basically the, um, the general approaches in protein structure prediction and design. Um, so before we get too far, um, let me just ask, um, why do we want to engineer proteins? Why did you take this class? What do you want to learn in this class? Why do we want to engineer proteins? <laughs> what do you have so far? Yeah. 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 So, uh, I mean, proteins are really high functioning, so if you can make, they bind and, and react really specifically and quickly. Yeah, proteins are high functioning. They bind and they react. What else? Krisha, did you guys come up with anything? Yeah, it, we thought that if we engineer enzymes, maybe we can uh, use them for biocatalysis. Enzymes, we can use for catalysis, biocatalysis. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. We can make sensors and localize them to various places. Sensors. Okay. We can also maybe do localization, get things to go where we want them to go. <clears throat> Other things, Jelly Osco. Sorry, I'm picking it up with people I know. All right, so say you've got an epitope in your uh, enzyme that is autoimmune, uh -huh. react, your immune system reacts against it. You might want to design it out and maintain sure. function. Sure, immunity uh, engineering. Say, uh, get rid of an epitope in a, a vaccine or a drug or something that we want to. Yeah, these are all good reasons. So why, why are proteins uh, such a good molecule for doing this? So, um, <clears throat> so proteins are the, um, are the building block of the cell. It's what all the, well not all, but it's what a lot of our DNA encodes for. So the, the big thing about proteins is we get uh, uh, a very particular structure. They fold into a structure and they are able to perform some kind of function. Right, so um, they can perform Perform a particular chemical or structural function, often because they have a particular So, yeah, so one of the magic things about proteins is they fold and they have structure. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, and uh, so that specific structure and the specific <coughs> surface chemistry that present gives them particular properties and allows them to do things, from binding things to reacting to things to performing being particular structures, say, acting in the cell. Um, and uh, so those are great properties to be able to exploit. Okay, so what are proteins? Everybody knows this. What's a protein? It's a polymer. A polymer of? So proteins are polymers of amino acids. Um, but a protein's not, um, yeah, so the polymers I uh, made up of the naturally occurring 20 amino acids. And, um, but they're not like any other polymer, right? Like, so I'm a chemical engineer, so. Um, Proteins are polymers, but they're, they're not exactly, right? How's a polymer different than a protein in particular? You know what I mean by polymer? It's like polyethylene or um, polystyrene. They make things out of polymers all the time. It doesn't have any secondary structure, tertiary. Coronary. Yeah, so proteins have structures. They might have secondary structure, helices, and strands. 
So proteins are um, composed of amino acids. Polymers could be any any particular any repeating chemical group. Uh, so you could have different uh, say ethylene glycol and uh, vinyl chloride, something like that. Um, <clears throat> But we can make polymers, right? We've been doing this since the 60s, and even before that, we've been making polymers. We have very high-tech polymers. We do a lot of very particular things with them. But why, why, why do we want to engineer a protein? I mean, why are they better than polymers? Yeah, Proteins are specific? They're going to be very specific. So um, the proteins are going to have a specific amino acid sequence. And this could be uh, uh, this could be basically any sequence of, of uh, residues that we put together in the gene to, to code for the proteins. Whereas polymers, you're typically polymerizing things. You can have heteropolymers of different things, but they're they're just long repeats. Polymers would be um, often would be a mix of lengths, whereas a protein would have a particular. So it's one of the very few molecules that we can exactly specify what we want the molecule to be and get up to very large molecular weights. So we have exquisite control over, um, over the, the chemical structure of the proteins. And all of this leads up to our, uh, our central paradigm of, of, of protein structures. Uh, is that the sequence codes for a structure, and the structure codes for a function. Right? So um, we can specify a particular sequence of a protein. That protein then will fold up into a particular structure. That particular structure will have a particular function. Uh, in evolution, you're the cells are evolving to optimize some kind of function or some kind of uh, fitness, and often that means creating a function, evolving on the sequence level to make this function happen. And so there's a feedback loop um, between this. Okay, so in order for us to understand if we want to engineer proteins to bind stronger or do particular reactions or make a particular nano shape, um, we want to be able to understand the sequence structure uh, relationship and then how that structure then relates to function. So that's one of the big goals of the class, is to understand quantitatively how these pieces fit together. Okay, so if we want to do, uh, so, so nature, well, if you observe nature and look at a genome sequence, we go in this direction. The sequence makes the structure, makes the function. But if we want to do design, we need to do the inverse of this. We need to take some function, decide from there what structure you might want to do that function. So say if you had a particular reaction you want to do, you need to put a nucleophile in the right place and a hydrogen bond donor in another place and uh, uh, a place for the products to come out somewhere else and you position these groups in space so you might define a structure. And then from that structure, you might then say, well, what kind of sequence could fold into that structure? So the design process is going to go in reverse. We're going to start with the function to derive the structure to derive the sequence. Okay, so for both of these, we need to understand the underlying principles. What underlies protein folding? What underlies protein function? What underlies uh, the relationships between the sequence and the structure? All right. Um, so one, uh, proteins, polymers, amino acids. Everybody knows what an amino acid is, right? We've seen this probably since high school. Um, we have an the amine is a nitrogen. Nitrogen will have a couple protons. It'll have a, an alpha carbon, so-called alpha carbon. It has a hydrogen on it and has some kind of functional group on the side. carbonyl group, C double bonded to a, an oxygen, and in its single form as a single amino acid, that'll be, a, 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 that'll be an acid group um, that'll have a C double O H on it. 
right? So that's our single amino acid. This is our amino group. This is our conial. And um, it's fairly simple, but it's what gives rise to our interest in chemistry because we have both the nitrogen and the amino function, and we also have the acid function of the carbonyl. And then we have that R group that um, allows us to get a lot of chemical complexity. Okay, so yeah, it's polymerized via a peptide bond. So if we take the nitrogen, the alpha carbon, and the CO, um, we can put a second one next to that with another nitrogen, an alpha carbon, and a CO. Um, to do that, we need to take away a proton from the nitrogen and an OH from the carbonyl. So uh, that's going to take away the water, so this is going to be a condensation reaction. It produces water, we get rid of water to make the amino acid bond. Um, so this is Now we have multiple side groups here, R1, R2, we can keep going, and C, R3, CO. So a proton up here. So we have a hydrogen on the alpha carbon. chain. There are uh, 20 naturally occurring. are what make the interesting chemistry and make it do different things. So we have different proteins that pull into different things. It's because we have different sequences of side chains. Okay, so how many people know this stuff? You've seen this before. Okay, so how many people know there are 20 amino acids? Yeah? Okay. Why don't we get into groups of two again, and why don't you see if you can write down, should we go for all 20? Should we just do like three or four? Um, so there's some major classes of amino acids, right? What are the major classes? So, so there's, there's hydrophobic amino acids. What are the hydrophobic amino acids? Just to review, let's just spit them out because you guys know. Why is that? Alanine. 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 Huh? Proline. Proline. Okay. Uh, what else? What is besides hydrophobic? What else do we have? Aromatic. Yeah, let's do aromatics. Which ones are aromatic? Tryptophan. Tryptophan, tyrosine. What we are? Uh, these don't have to be exclusive categories, right? Uh, I'm Alan. <laughs> okay. What else? Um, how about charged amino acids? <coughs> Not 
steering? No, you can make steering. How can you make steering charge? You take a lot of pH. Maybe with kinase, we could use steering to get a kinase. Phosphorylated. Phosphorylated. That would make a lot of charge in your steering. So phosphorylated for sure. Uh, glutamine. Spartic acid. Spartic acid. Glutamic acid. What's the charge on those? Okay, so uh, negative. So somebody probably knows all of these questions in here. By by next week, everybody should know the answer to all of these questions, um, at least to memorize it once. If you forget it later, that'd be okay. But, um, so uh, yeah, so those two are negative. Uh, how about positive charge to amino acids? Lysine. Lysine and. More. It's a pirate's favorite. <laughs> Great. Uh, what else? Uh, aromatics, hydrophobics, and how about how about polars? Non-charged polar amino acids. People have seen that three-letter code before. ARG for arginine, people have seen the three-letter code before, so you need to know your three-letter codes and your one-letter codes. There's also one-letter codes, because, um, well, the three letters are convenient. That's nice when you print things out, because people can remember them, but the one, one letter is really convenient for um, compact sequences, so you want to you memorize those two. All right, what else? Polar amino acids. What are we missing? Cysteine. 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 Serine. Add, an, add another CH2 group to serine. Serine. Okay, how many do we have so far? 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Wow, we're missing a few. Missing the thionine. The thionine. Standard amino acids, um, nonpolar aliphatics. So glycine is the lack of a side chain. We just have a hydrogen. Um, alanine is our smallest simpleton with a side chain, CH3, the heavy atom side chain. Um, valine looks like a V. Leucine is a little longer, looks like a V. Isoleucine is four carbons, but rearranged from leucine. Branches early instead of late. And the thionine has a sulfur in it. Um, aromatics, phenyl, tyrosine, tryptophan, we got those okay. So uh, tryptophan has two rings. And nitrogen, tyrosine has the hydroxyl group. If I asked you to draw amino acid with a hydroxyl group, you should have a few choices for those. Um, the phenyl, phenyl alanine is straight hydrophobic. Let's see the next set, uh, polar, uncharged, serine, threonine, cysteine. Proline. So these guys are calling proline polar. It's got a lot of CH groups, so it's kind of on the fence there. But everything, every every amino acid is polar, right? Because every amino acid has the um, the amine group and the acid group. So um, every amino acid is polar, and then the side chain is modulated. Oh, it's sparagine and glutamine. Yeah, so sparagine. those. So those are like the um, glutamate and aspartate that uh, except for the hydrogen it's a, another OH there. What else? Uh, positively charged. Lysines, arginines, and histidine can be positively charged if your pH is lower than 
eight, six point four, something like that. In biological context, histamine is often charged. And negative groups uh, with the COO, aspartate is the short one, and glutamate has two extra ones there. Um, right, so there's the whole bunch. Um, I gave you on another view with kind of the stereochemical views, so you can they're grouped a little differently. Um, great. All right, any questions about the amino acids? So you should be able to tell me who's charged, not charged, who's got oxygen or hydroxyl group, which ones have acid groups, which ones are positive, negative, um, all the general properties of amino acid. I should be able to ask you um, for the quiz in a couple of weeks, and then we'll all have that in our brains. I'm going to do a little bit of nomenclature so we can talk about things. And see, see, oh. So that's our backbone nitrogen, our backbone carbon and oxygen in the carbonyl group. Um, as I mentioned, that carbon we call the alpha carbon. And as we then go out to our side chain, we're going to label each of these atoms with a letter from the Greek alphabet. So C alpha, C beta, C gamma, C delta. Epsilon, C zeta, and C zeta. I'm not Greek, as you can tell. C zeta and eta one and then eta two. What amino acid do I have here? Charged. This is this is arginine. Um, so lots of CH groups. Arginine has the most uh, labels that you need. So we label these C alpha, C beta, C gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, and eta. And so the most amino acids, we won't need that many letters, but we have a nomenclature to talk about this. Um, what else? Uh, we have some angles. We call, sorry, we call this angle phi and this angle psi, which we connect to Chains. We're going to use uh, chi to label these angles. This is chi 1, chi 2, chi 3, etc. 4, 5. We don't worry about chi 6 too much because these protons can spin around pretty freely. But if we want to place all these heavy atoms, we need to know at least those torsion angles. Skipped a couple steps. So let's back up. Um, so, um, if, so if we're doing structure prediction and design, we need to put this stuff in the computer. We need coordinates for the atoms. We need to put the atoms somewhere in space. So I need to know things about the geometry. Um, so one thing I need to know is bond lengths. Um, how far is it between the nitrogen and the alpha carbon? How far is it between the alpha carbon and the carbonyl carbon? How far is it between the alpha carbon and the beta carbon? So it turns out that bond lengths are practically constant. So um, we've 
crystallize many structures of proteins, a little bit, many of them, and pretty much the N to C alpha distance is pretty much always the same. Um, so we can look that up in a table. Um, turns out that bond angles are practically constant. Except tau, which varies by two to three degrees. Okay, so I didn't show you tau. So bond angles mean um, the angle between three um, three successive atoms. So tau is the angle around the alpha carbon right here. This is tau. So you have an angle between the N, the C, and the C alpha, the C alpha, the N, and the, C, and the next C alpha. So every three atoms, you can make an angle out of those three uh, points, and those are the bond angles. Those are also practically constant. So I write practically because they're not exactly constant. They vibrate. You're in some kind of energetic well. It's essentially a quadratic well, and these things vibrate. That's how we get IR spectra, by looking at these uh, resonant vibrations between the atoms. But if we're going to predict the structure of proteins, um, well, so far, the, most of the good methods use average constant values for this. There's definitely a question in the research whether we could get better by letting these values vary a little bit, but for the moment, we'll keep those constant. Okay, so bond lengths and angles are tabulated. In paper by Eng and Huber back in 1991. So he's been around for a little while, and this is one of the articles that I posted on the website for reference. You don't need to read the whole article, but the tables will be useful so you have these lengths and angles. Great, so if everything's constant, what's the tough part? Well, it, um, the tough part then are what's called these torsion angles. So the torsion angles, omega is about 180 degrees. Um, so omega is this bond between uh, the carbonyl group and the nitrogen across this peptide bond. Um, I'm sure you've talked about the chemistry of this. This carbonyl group has resonance structures that makes this double bond resonate with the nitrogen and the free electron pair there that essentially puts this in one uh, set of p orbitals that puts uh, this peptide bond all together in a plane, right? So, so omega is typically fixed at 180 degrees. There's one exception to that. You know the exception? The exception is cisproline. Cisproline, which circles back on itself and binds to the backbone, because of that interaction, can uh, uh, can be on the cis side of it instead of uh, these being, actually I kind of drew this cis, these should be drawn, it's hard to draw on the board in 3D, but they should be trans, and if they flip over to cis, that's the yeah, cisproline. So proline has cispro, where omega is about zero degrees in about 25% of prolines. Okay. So given that, that means phi and psi are the source of the most significant variability. These phi and size are torsion angles. If we take four atoms, we're looking at this bond. What the torsion angle is is where we spin around the bond. Right? Um, so that's, that's the angle we're looking at. If we draw, let me draw this peptide bond again. We draw C alpha, C O, N, H. So what happens is because of this bond, these all become planar. And we end up having a, let's see, this next to a C alpha. We 
of having it. This set of atoms all in one plane. Okay. And that C alpha connects to the next CO, which connects to the next N, H, and the next C alpha. These atoms all end up being the same plane. So then we have two planes, and those planes can swivel back and forth um, using those angles. So here's again, this is the phi angle. It's going to twist this plane around the alpha carbon. And then here's the psi angle. It's going to twist the second plane around the alpha carbon. So basically, we have a set of planes. and make a chain and you have all these planes that you can twist around as you as you go down the chain. Okay, so these are planar time units. Okay. Great. So um, we then could look at uh, what we could then uh, thinking like a maybe a computational scientist, maybe not like an observational biologist, but like a computational scientist, you could say, well, okay, if that's true, if those are the rules I give you, then I could create a bunch of protein structures just by moving phi and psi and flopping these things around, and I should be able to see what proteins are going to do. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's actually been uh, done, and people have calculated this. Um, and Linus Pauling was one of the first ones to try and calculate what these structures are when you twist these angles around. And then uh, um, Ramachandran was the one who eventually looked at a lot of data once we had a lot of structures. And it turns out, so as you twist these around, the problem is at certain twists, what's going to happen is these atoms are going to bump into each other and they're not going to work. Okay, you're not going to be able to put these, these angles together. So uh, that's kind of one of the first lessons of protein folding, is we start to move these angles around and do things, things clash and they just don't fit together, even with just the backbone, regardless of the side chains. Um, so here's a version where uh, this paper by Mandel in the 70s, based on the same kind of calculations that, that, that Pauling started with. Um, if you look at when does the oxygen atom of the N plus 1 residue interact with the carbon atom of the N residue, so when does this oxygen and this carbon come and bump into each other, you can calculate that that happens when phi gets to a certain value and it excludes things that are over here and only allows things here. So people have looked at this using ideal spheres and put things together and said, hey, a lot of times stuff bounces into each other. So if you do that and you plot phi versus psi and you exclude all of these regions where things bump into each other, you end up with three big regions of space. Um, this region down here, around phi minus 60, psi minus 60, which you all know is alpha helices. And then this region up here that's beta sheets with positive psi's and negative phi's. Um, this stuff over here has to do with bumping into the, um, the L amino acid, the chiral, chiral amino acid. Um, and then here's actual data of main chain dihedrals from high resolution protein structures. This is from Richardson's Anatomy and Taxonomy of Protein Structure. Jane Richardson is one of the pioneers who did some of the very first computer models, wrote some of the first programs to display proteins on the computer, and then she spent hours and hours just looking at these beautiful structures and watching the patterns and taking the data and tabulating and discovering all of this stuff. So um, Jane's article is fantastic to read, gives you a lot of detail, but here you can see this alpha region and this beta region, and they're a little bit different because it turns out things are a little bit squishy and the bond angles can vary a little bit and the bond distances can vary a little bit and the chemistry of the side chains also matter. So the experiment's a little different than the, the original calculation there. All right, uh, this is a plot for glycine residues. What's different about this plot? Here's the original Ramachandran plot, which if you've seen before, it's probably what you've seen. This is the one for glycine. How's it different? Go ahead. Uh, glycine is a lot more flexible, so you see that it has uh, phi side and both side are included in areas of the plot. 
You have different regions, you have, you have points over here where you don't have points uh, before. I'm looking for a word that starts with S to describe this plot. Symmetric, this one's symmetric. Why is glycine symmetric? There's a hydrogen on the alpha carbon. So glycine and CHH. CO, if there's two hydrogens, there's no L or D form, whereas uh, for other amino acids, the, it's always an L form. There's always a particular stereochemistry to this alpha carbon, and that stereochemistry breaks symmetry, and so you only have, um, you have this asymmetric diagram. But here it's symmetric, so the, the left and right should be the same. You should be able to uh, take phi negative and semi negative and get the same result. And that's, what you, that's what you see. CASP, where uh, new structures, three-dimensional structures of proteins are determined, and before they're published, the sequences are sent out to theoreticians, and they try to fold the proteins. So the first two times they did this, nobody got any answers correct. This was in the 90s. It was a very frustrating time in the field. People thought they had algorithms that worked. It turned out, if they thought they did, they were fooling themselves on their own algorithms, and uh, it turns out the blind test is the only real true test you can do to, to see if you really know what you're talking about. So the CASP experiment, they sent out these sequences, and this is what David Baker's lab came back with. It's not exactly right, but you can see the helices are in the right place. So these are some of the very first blindly, correctly predicted protein folds happened around the year 2000. This is the beginning of the Rosetta program. Uh, this is protein protein docking. This is a very non-humble tour. This is uh, some work that I did when I first came to Hopkins. This is another blind challenge where we're given two proteins and we have to dock them together. So the problem is the underlying biophysics is the same. We're using Rosetta, again, the same program you're using. And this is the two colors is our prediction and the experimental result of the complex. And we can see that we've correctly predicted this orientation and we've even predicted these side chains in the right place. So again, this is more evidence that our, our uh, strategies are starting to work. This is a very recent result from a couple of people in my lab, Brian Weitzner and, and uh, Daisuke Kuroda. Um, antibodies are hugely important to the pharmaceutical industry. It's about a third of the drug pipeline. Um, a lot of times you develop antibodies by injecting stuff into mice and they give you sequences that then they make. They don't necessarily know why they bind or how they bind or if they want to manipulate them, how to make them bind tighter. So one important step is to get the structure. Structure isn't always easy to get experimentally, so we have um, computational methods to predict the structures. This is the H3 loop. This is the one that's most important for binding, and we get these predicted within an angst within an angstrom in some cases, um, not all cases. Um, so uh, again, this is a blind prediction where drug companies had antibodies. They gave us sequences. We predicted them, and then afterward, they showed us the structures. Um, yeah, these are selected results. There's a lot of results that don't come out right, and that's why it's still research. On the design side, um, the first designed protein was a zinc finger. By, uh, well, it was a zinc finger. This is a zinc finger fold, and usually there's a zinc right here in the middle. And what Steve Mayo's group did with Basil de Hyatt is they pulled the zinc out, and they used the computer to fill up the space with side chains, notably these aromatics, and they got the protein to fold and be a well-behaved protein without the zinc. So that was the very first protein design, by co-opting a natural protein and having it do something else. Um, skipping a few years where there were other milestones, but the first uh, ab initio design fold, this is Brian Hulman using Rosetta in David Baker's lab, literally drew on the back of an envelope a bunch of strands and a helix in shapes that don't occur in nature, in a particular fold that doesn't occur in nature, digitized it in the computer, made a sequence, and it folded into that shape. So that was the very first ab initio, completely new fold in 2003, so 10 years ago now. Um, the first enzyme was reported in 2005. We'll talk about that later. There were problems with it in 2008. <coughs> Um, this is a chemical elimination reaction where they position side chains to make this elimination reaction go. Um, it's a pretty lousy enzyme compared to what nature does, but it is active. Um, so there's work to be done on that. Um, small molecule binders, just last year, Christy Tinberg, again with Rosetta, this is a, she made a pocket, put a small molecule in there, and shaped the pocket by redesigning the side chains and stabilizing the fold around it, and she got uh, micromolar binders out of the computer. Um, a common strategy today is to get a starter out of the computer and then use evolution to evolve something stronger. So from that, they were able to get picomolar binders um, through experimental um, selection techniques. Uh, nanotube binders. This is Gregor Gregorian working in uh, Bill DeGrotto's lab. 
There's a nanotube, and uh, the Borg looked at the geometry of the nanotube, put helices around the side, calculated the different ways helices could pack around it, and then designed side chains to, to pack. And what he can do is actually recognize different size nanotubes and different, different ways of wrapping the nanotubes up, wrapping the gap, graphene sheet. Um, so that came out a few years ago. And um, a couple of years ago, protein cages. If you could do a protein interface, this is a, a, a trimer that was already occurring. They took the trimer and made an interface between two trimers at an angle such that you put a bunch of the trimers on an octahedron and you get a cube. This is Neil King's group, uh, Neil King's lab. Uh, I've been using Rosetta, and um, there's now two component cages, and they're trying to figure out how to put things inside. So that's kind of some of the exciting things that have been done in the last few years, and that's the kind of stuff that um, we want to learn about. And again, about half of these are done with Rosetta. There are other codes, but Rosetta will get us, um, we'll have access to all the routines that did this and to 